So what if big data was the only option that we have to solve the big problems that we're working on, rather than something that we're preferring to do because we, we think that we can improve the uh, bottom line? Um, the work that we are spending our time on really uh, is punctuated by uh, telling the story of these two boys, and I know them quite well. Simba and Sean were born on exactly the same day. Their fathers work in exactly the same lab, and they live 200 meters apart. When they were born, Simba was six centimeters shorter than Sean. And then over time, until now, when they're four years old, uh, Simba is now about 16 centimeters short, shorter than, than Sean. Stunting or shortness for age is a problem that we have to deal with, and it is an indicator of failure to thrive and predicts immediate and lifelong disadvantages, including higher mortality and morbidity. And there's a lot of money that has been spent by different organizations and different researchers to measure child growth and development. But what you end up having is these data graveyards, where people move on after they've finished their nature or science paper, um, the excellent statistician who was in the group as a postdoc leaves, and all the data just gets thrown away like this. I think this is a travesty. Because the data that has been generated over the last 100 years, 1917 was the first uh, year of the child, could actually be used to solve some of the problems that we're dealing with today. And that is the premise of the work that I'm going to be talking about. Now, Simba is measured and has been measured over the last uh, four years of his life. And what I didn't mention in the beginning was the fact that Sean was actually born uh, at 32 weeks gestation. So he was born about five weeks uh, uh, premature, but still was en ended up being much, much bigger than uh, Simba was. So we know that part of this problem can be explained by genetics, but we also know that that impact of genetics changes over time. So can we actually use the data that has been generated over the last 100 years to, to try separate out what is the portion of genetics versus environmental enteropathies that actually impact our growth outcomes? And this is important given some of the uh, uh, discussions that were uh, going on earlier today around personalized healthcare. Because as we're talking more about personalized public health, we actually have to start modifying our thoughts about protecting the rights of the individual and the ownership of the data, but also leveraging information that has been generated over time so that we can uh, promote the greater good for the public. And that is something that we need to uh, be dealing with together, mainly because the children that we're talking about remain de-identified, invisible, and completely unaccounted for, and unrepresented, because if you're planning to do a study and just publish it in Nature or Science, you're likely to exclude some of these children that we need to be looking after. So the project that I'm leading at the foundation right now has created a knowledge base that has about 8 million children, uh, longitudinal uh, uh, data from different studies in 26 countries. And uh, uh, the data comes from 137 uh, uh, clinical studies, which have at least uh, 700 covariates captured in, in each of these data sets. So we're looking at demographic, clinical, socioeconomic uh, uh, covariates being captured. And at the same time, we have population survey data that, can be, uh, that have been uh, collected over the years in about 160 million children from 50 countries. And these countries are actually uh, the ones uh, of, of particular interest because they, they uh, provide about 90% of the stunting burden that we're talking about. And uh, out of the 400 or so uh, uh, surveys and censuses that are available, we have as many as 1,000 variables that are, are, are collected. And these include nutritional uh, growth, disease burden, um, uh, mortality, as well as uh, access to healthcare. We have a team of about 120 data scientists that is working to analyze this data together. And the learning platform that we have helps us to learn who is actually sub, uh, submitting data into, uh, into the knowledge, uh, knowledge base. What kind of questions are the uh, investigators interested in? What is the quality? Um, and, and also, we are able to uh, obfuscate some of this data and actually get 
communities that are interested in data science to have open in innovation contests. Uh, we have hackathons around these data sets so that we get to access uh, the best minds and the people who can apply some of the latest methodologies that are not usually used in this space in order to uh, promote our, our learning. The other thing that's important to point out in, in the slide is the fact that we are actually looking at growth as a life cycle process rather than a, a piecemeal uh, process where you're either interested in uh, fetal growth or postnatal growth because we know that it, in order to be able to figure out how to uh, provide the best care for each individual that is impacted, the, uh, you need to be able to target specific intervals within the life cycle in order to uh, get the best outcomes. The other thing that's important, and uh, this is a bias of mine because I'm an engineer, is the fact that we need to actually start uh, Im implementing a systems approach to uh, figuring out uh, growth, growth outcomes. So that uh, fall of the die, which is really the genetics that most of the children start off with here, is important as an input. Uh, but we also need to understand the interaction between nutrition, water sanitation and hygiene, inflammation and infection that impacts uh, these, uh, these children and whatever medication that, that they might uh, have available, and also the different insults that they experience over the, uh, the life course. Uh, at the same time, we know that there's a lot of modulators and confounders uh, uh, that uh, are between the input and the output. So trying to quantify the relationship between physical growth and brain development is going to be important for us to understand what is driving the difference uh, between Simba and Sean, and whether the, this difference in height is actually something that is uh, phenomenologically important or is just that difference uh, mainly because uh, of, of the fact that maybe uh, three generations ago, uh, Simba's uh, grandmother or great-grandmother was exposed uh, to uh, terrible uh, infection and, and was living in drought conditions and that has been passed on to, to Simba over generations. So I wanted to show some early uh, learnings from uh, this work that we have. Uh, we uh, are actually using these uh, four studies as the main uh, cohort studies that uh, cover about 200,000 uh, uh, children uh, that are combined. The studies were very different designs, as you can see from the uh, middle panel, and we're using measurements from ultrasound, so head circumference measurement uh, uh, during uh, fetal growth from as early as uh, 10 weeks post gestation up until birth, and also uh, growth uh, over time uh, 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 since, since uh, birth. And what you can see from these studies is even though the first two studies, Intergrowth 21 and Interbio 21, were real, really um, the uh, growth standard uh, studies that were being generated in order to uh, have uh, standards that are used as, uh, for, for global uh, growth measurement, you, you find that the Gasto study and this uh, Born in Guangzhou study uh, that are at the bottom that have completely different designs and were uh, uh, actually generated from hospitals, when you combine all the data, the data lines up really nicely when you look at the, uh, the third, 50th, and 97 percentiles over this uh, data set. So some of the uh, concerns that a lot of people have around quality issues, uh, we've already shown that it's really usually a myth uh, uh, in some cases. Uh, but there, there are obviously some, uh, some issues that, uh, that arise from some of the data sets that we're looking at. Um, the other thing that we're able to do now that we uh, have this massive database uh, in place is that we can look at the relationship between body length and head circumference over time and essentially use uh, a, a method that's similar to fact sorting where the black circle that you have there is the, the median growth pattern of a lot of the children. But, uh, the uh, other scatters show uh, children that are uh, generally large uh, over time or uh, children that are generally uh, small or faulted. But then interesting patterns showing that children that start off high and end up low or low start high will, uh, will actually help, end up helping us figure out uh, out of these phenotypes, what, what are potential uh, covariates that explain that? And since these phenotypes can also be matched to some children that have very good uh, um, developmental uh, images that have been uh, 
determined from uh, MRI. We can also use uh, deep learning methods to uh, understand what is the relationship between uh, growth outcomes and uh, developmental outcomes. So this is an effort that's ongoing, and we are looking for additional people to, uh, to join us in this effort, because we think that using data and engaging uh, the best talent in, in uh, analytics to be working on these problems with us will really change uh, some of the approaches in global health. So if you're interested in joining this effort with us, uh, we look forward, uh, I look forward to talking to you if you're if available. And this 3D uh, comes down to the fact that we, we believe that all lives have equal value, no matter where they're being lived. Thank you.